black, but etched into the hull. Butterfield and the Buttercup. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. It's so nice to see people in person again. That's awesome. My name is Sam Perlman. I'm the Deputy Director and Development Manager for the York County Maritime Museum. And like I'm so Christian Society team, we welcome you to our monthly spe Maritime Speaker Series. Uh, if you have picked up one of these, you will see that uh, these were printed before we made a switch for our November program. Uh, but just as a reminder, it's the first Thursday of every month from October through May at seven o'clock. All the programs are free. And we do ask that if you are watching online in that world, uh, that you make a donation to a food charity near you. Or if you're coming here to the museum, you can bring a non-perishable food item and we will make sure that that gets the appropriate uh, organization. Uh, we are excited uh, to have, now we were we were going to have Dan Hebler talk about the Gales of November. We know we have a big anniversary coming up in just a few days. Uh, but Dan was not able to join us, uh, but we are so excited to have our friends from PBS Wisconsin here uh, to give us a super sneak preview of their new shipwreck documentary and some of the, beyond the documentary, some of the amazingly cool things that they are doing in educational and interactive programming. So I am going to step away because you don't didn't come to hear me talk. You came to hear John Moskowski uh, from, Maybe they did. <laughs> <laughs> from PBS Wisconsin, and he's going to introduce his team, and we're going to be on our way. Thank you, Great. Thank you. Nice to meet you. John Moskowski, director of PBS Wisconsin. The thing that occurs to me every time I come here is that our connection um, to the maritime world is remember um, that broadcasting, uh, what later became radio broadcasting, really was an innovation that was built on communication to ships. Um, you know, we had the wired world by, by you know, that turn of the century a little earlier where they were trying to figure out this thing that later called radio, uh, which we kind of call broadcasting, uh, but it was those ships. That really is how we're going to communicate. So, um, um, and so in those early years of, before the turn of the century, you're seeing this really innovation on what this, on what these radio waves could do. Um, one of the places that really embraced this idea of Wisconsin was Wisconsin. So at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, the physics department really embraced this new technology. And if you look at that time and the teens, in the, especially in the teens and into the 20s, this was like the, a boom thing. It was like um, Gates and those other people getting into the internet. They were getting into this really interesting thing called radio. To understand it, with Wisconsin, public broadcasting was invented here. We were the first um, continually operating station on the campus of UW-Madison and really was the first real public television station and an early public television, first public radio station and a very early public television station. To understand how early we were in radio, our first broadcasts were in Morse code. No. <laughs> and what's really amazing if you read about it at that time is that they like see this technology as a way to connect with the state. And it's like, how did they see that? How did they, it's dots and dashes. But you know, again, people before that had already been experimenting with voice. And, and then they really recognized that this Wisconsin idea of taking that, um, um, the, the, what we learn and what's studied on those campuses, you know, in Madison and around the state, um, should be delivered to the state. So in the physics department, uh, in about 1914, really this idea of public broadcasting starts. And then in 1917, they arranged the first voice broadcast. Now, again, there was some experimenting with voice broadcasts, especially even before the turn of the century with uh, shipping and things like that, um, but the first one in Wisconsin. And so they organized this event and a concert. They had like a, 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 a form of, uh, uh, orchestra, probably a quartet, right? Something small in one place. They gathered in this professor's uh, home to hear this broadcast with voice. And they were all disappointed. 
And we're like, who cares? I can listen to the radio. I can listen to music with a phonograph. I can go to a concert. I don't, I don't need it. But there was a vision on that campus that this, this technology could be really used to connect our state, uh, both with learning uh, uh, and certainly education and, and, and materials to the school. So all that is an introduction um, to this project is, is just so completely reinventing um, uh, how we work in, at PBS, the Public Television in PBS Wisconsin. Our new name, a little, little, takes me a little while to spit that out. And Amber is here and is going to show a little bit of that. One part we won't show today is also there's an educational um, video game that's been part of this project as well. So kind of using technology. Um, to deliver uh, service and learning to the state is what we've been about for more than 100 years. And it really started with those folks who said, there's something really, some amazing possibility here with these dots and dashes that we can connect our state. So that's my, my brief history of public broadcasting in this country. And um, I wanna thank you uh, for su supporting PBS Wisconsin. And then I want to acknowledge before we start this place and places like this across the state. You simply, you know, when you watch the show and you see the photos and you see the interviews and you see the knowledge that's conveyed, it's because someone cared about that information. Organizations like this saved those photos, saved the film, wrote things down. You know, other way, if we didn't have any of that, we'd have nothing, right? Um, and so I hope as you see this, think about organizations like this and what they mean to our communities and to our state that preserving these stories for future generations. So this is a story, you know, in many ways it's current because of that link out there, that it is a little still tricky, right? We understand that, but in a lot of ways, it's a different world. And so these places, the kind of work we do is try to convey that understanding and how we are connected to the past and how that past informs us. So. Um, that's my brief introduction, and Amber's going to talk a little bit about I like this a little bit about how this project in particular has been really inventing our work, and then David is going to give you the very first look. Nobody has seen this before outside our building at uh, this new documentary coming on November 30th. So your homework is to share it November 30th, right? You can remember that day. It's my wedding anniversary. If you need another way to remember it, remember pretty it. So at least one person in the world remembers that date for that reason. <laughs> um, November 30th, and we'll have the premiere. So your homework is then to share it. So you'll see it, you'll love it, you'll talk about it, and then you share it with your friends and to tune in, and it, it looks really interesting. And now Amber is going to tell a little bit about uh, some really interesting work that's part of this. Amber, thanks. Hey, John. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thanks for having us today. Uh, so as John mentioned, um, we're working on this beautiful shipwreck documentary that I'm kind of the opening act. You're going to see that to actually save it. Um, but as part of that project, we've actually been looking at other ways to expand the stories. So we have our documentary. We have the educational game that's going into classrooms later in the spring. And then the third part of this is uh, a collection of interactive experiences that we call shipwrecks, the immersive experience. And this is a way for us to take these stories of these shipwrecks and bring that underwater experience to people in brand new ways that they may not ever get to experience otherwise. So these are interactive experiences that will live online. They'll be accessed through a web browser, through a mobile browser, or even a VR headset. I'm gonna show you a little sneak peek of what these look like. All three of these interactive experiences um, are based around the story of SS Wisconsin. This is an iron packet and passenger steamer that sank in 1929 in Lake Michigan off the coast of Kenosha. And our team looked at the stories of the SS Wisconsin and thought it'd be a really great story to dive deeper into. Sorry, can't help the pun. Um, and so each of our experiences focuses on a different element of the SS Wisconsin story. Our first one is an underwater dive that takes place in 360. To actually feel what it's like to go underwater on a dive and swim through the shipwreck. The second one is a virtual tour of the Wisconsin in 1929 on the night of its sinking. So it's a kind of a recreation of the historical narrative of what happened on that night. And then the third experience is a virtual tour of the shipwreck on the lake bed today. I'll talk a little bit about how we developed these in a 
to show you a sneak peek. Uh, first and foremost, we work very closely with a lot of organizations around the state, including the Wisconsin Historical Society, to gather research about the Wisconsin, to gather all these stories to make sure our stories are um, accurately conveyed. So we were looking at blueprints and images, newspaper articles, survivor accounts, investigations, to make sure that we built this the right way. Once we had identified the Wisconsin as our primary story point, uh, we arranged a dive down to the Wisconsin in June of 2020 and took along a 360 camera, as I mentioned, down to the wreck. And while we were down there, we also did what's called a photogrammetry scan. So it's an actual underwater data scan of the shipwreck and allows us to capture the data. So this is an actual scan of the wreck. Um, we worked with the Wisconsin Institute for discovery to then take that data and craft a digital 3D model. So that is kind of what we started as a foundation for our experience. This is what it actually looks like underwater. Um, and then we, of course, wanted to create the ship in its original state as well, which, again, we had to go back and do a whole lot of research about what did it look like? What can we find in photographs? How was it described in newspaper articles? What colors were included? What materials were used at that time? So that we could then begin to craft a 3D replica. So this is kind of um, a, a first pass at what one of these interior spaces looked like. But of course, we need to paint it from there. So we took these 3D models and then with all that research, began to paint them and begin to craft the interior of the ship. So this is the, uh, the pilot house. We took this uh, original model here that we made and started again applying all those details and textures to really bring that story to life of what the ship looked like in 1929. And then the last piece of kind of putting these uh, this puzzle together was this idea of ambient sound. So we're creating immersive experiences that happen um, all around you, spin around and look. And a really critical part of that is what's called ambisonic audio. So this is audio that feels like it's sourced from different areas no matter where you're looking. So as you spin around, the audio tracks with you. So this was a, a really fun uh, way to bring that immersive feeling to the experience. So especially effective in a VR headset, I'll say. So without further ado, I have a little clip I'll show you first. Um, this is our virtual tour. So this is what it looks like on a web browser. Um, this is a tour of the sinking. So this is the, the night that the ship went down. Um, so people can go on the, on the ship open it up on the web browser on a mobile device and actually spin around and look in the space. Now I've taken the audio off here so that you would hear um, the, the full ambient sound there. We also have a narrator telling the story of the ship. So here we are at the engine room. We have the ability to bring up further details uh, on the engine, on different props and things in the space that then allow you to dive deeper and really um, so you can see up close what these elements look like. So this is our, the triple expansion steam engine that was on the ship. So this experience kind of takes you through that full narrative. Um, again, I encourage you to check that out in, at the end of November when we launch that on our website. The engine room as the water starting to rise. So clip from the next experience. This one is the actual virtual tour of the shipwreck on the lake bed today. Um, so this is the one that was created based on that 3D scan underwater. And it uses real underwater footage um, as well. So this is what, what that shipwreck looks like. And again, you can kind of navigate through along the positions along the ship and see underwater video to see what it looks like to the divers, go into the cargo hold to see what the cargo looks like today. Um, it's really uh, a pretty incredible experience to feel like you're, you're truly underwater the divers there. And you'll all get a chance. You're invited to uh, to try this out in the virtual reality that will be there next year. And the last one I'll show you is this is our dive underwater. This is our 360 dive. And this is a, a video that was captured. I actually think David you're in this one actually. Um, so this is our, our 360 video when our videographer went underwater with the camera. And you get to actually see what that's like, again, on a mobile device, tablet, uh, or in a virtual reality headset. And this one gives you the experience of the full dive down. 
Um, and then we've added, again, a narration and different graphics and captions and things to point out different elements of interest as you swim along with our diver. Spin around, you can see him right there. Thanks, Billy. So I invite you all to try these at the end if, you, if you'd like to stop by. We'll have a virtual reality headset in the back of the room. Um, we're also making some cardboard viewers. So as part of our uh, program, when this program airs, we have the ability for people to get one of these cardboard VR viewers. So it's just a little pop-up viewer and you actually put your phone inside and your phone becomes the screen and then you can actually look around. <laughs> The Jim Chris Maritime Light. This program is brought to you by combined resources of the. Um, so a little, little more background on the. <laughs> so this this is a first thing you'll see is a logo. It's our partnership logo. We call it so, um, and we have a long partnership with the Wisconsin Historical Society. And uh, you know, we've been doing many programs with them over the years. 
Um, and they they have um, a very strong um, underwater archaeology department there, and they have for a long time. So um, it's actually one of the stronger programs in the country. And they've they've been they're really the um, experts kind of on the on a lot of the ships that are that are on the bottom. Um, and I think um, in the show we talked about they there are now seventy five on on the regist National Register of Historic Places. So that's the kind of work they do. They identify the ships, they survey them, um, and gather all sorts of data and history about them, and then submit that for um, preservation status. <laughs> This program is brought to you by combined resources of the Wisconsin Historical Society and PBS Wisconsin. On the bottom of Wisconsin waters lie the wrecks of over 700 ships. Frozen in time, each tangle of wreckage sheds light on a maritime mystery. What ship is it? How was it built? What was it carrying? And what happened to the ship and the crew? Each shipwreck also tells a Wisconsin story of a state that grew strong because of shipping and the Great Lakes. Of Wisconsin sailors and coastal communities facing the dangers of the unforgiving lakes. Wisconsin divers made history by pioneering new ways to explore shipwrecks. And our maritime historians led the effort to understand them and to protect them for future generations. When you see a shipwreck, especially with a lot of the stuff still on it, that's just really fascinating. Especially if you're diving a little bit of a deeper wreck and you're going down the anchor line and all of a sudden the shadow appears below you. And as you keep going down, there it is. It's like you're, you know, museum of the past on the bottom of the lake it draws you down there funding for shipwrecks is provided by the david l and rita e nelson family fund within the community foundation for the fox valley region the Dwight and Linda Davis Foundation, Dr. Henry Anderson and Shirley Levine, Robert J. Lentz, A. Paul Jones Charitable Trust, City of Sheboygan, Elizabeth Parker, Sharon and Tim Thousand, the Ruth St. John and John Dunham West Foundation, Ron and Colleen Wires, Wisconsin Coastal Management Program and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. John J. Frouchy Family Foundation. Trust Point. Focus Fund for Wisconsin Programs, supported in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And Friends of PBS Wisconsin. On the Great Lakes, you get these fall gales. And it's almost like a small hurricane on the Great Lakes. You get caught out one of those and, and you're, you're, you're in big trouble. Things like coal and uh, grain had to be delivered in the fall. And of course, the gales of November, this is when the worst weather comes to the Great Lakes. Ship owners would often press captains to make that last trip of the season uh, past when it was probably prudent to do so. There were no weather reports at the time. There was no weather radar. Ships would leave on a November morning and everybody kind of knew in the back of their mind that there were gonna be big storms. Before you have modern navigation, uh, GPS and radios and radar, 
you really were on your own with your own skills as a mariner. A surprising number of shipwrecks were due to collision, fog, and reduced visibility. Thousands of immigrants traveled to Wisconsin on early wooden steamers, which gave rise to one of the most dreaded causes of shipwrecks. When vessels were switching from sail to steam, fire was a big cause of maritime disasters. The steamer Phoenix, which was carrying immigrants from Holland, they had almost reached the very end of their journey going to the community of Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And there was a fire that broke out and uh, the vessel was quickly engulfed and over 180 people lost their lives. It's one of the largest maritime disasters here on the lakes. This family Bible was found washed up on shore, a symbol of the lost lives and lost hopes for a better life. The few individuals that did make it ashore in lifeboats did settle in the Sheboygan area and their descendants are still there today and hold that story very close. Wisconsin's maritime history stretches back many thousands of years before the first Europeans arrived. In the waters of Lake Mary in Kenosha County, the Nagel family spotted a piece of that ancient history. Me and my grandma went out in that sailboat there looking for what my dad saw. There's the original piece that was found. We saw it. We picked it up with his pitchfork. And I said, Grandma, I think this is an Indian dugout canoe. My daughter said, All right, I think it is. And of course, myself being an archaeologist, I was very interested right away and uh, went out, checked it out, and sure enough, it's the front end of a canoe, a dugout canoe. Looking at it, we decided right away that it was a little bit unusual. There were no metal tool marks of any sort. It looked like it had been charred and then the interior scraped out, uh, which would mean that it was prehistoric. We put it back in the water. I called the uh, State Historical Society. They have maritime archaeologists. Uh, at that time, it was Dave Cooper and Jeff Gray. And they actually swam through silt and felt their way around to find more pieces. At that point, they took the dugout and all the pieces back to the State Historical Society for some conservation work. Radiocarbon dating is a great way to date organics. And of course, a tree is organic. And we just took a sample and sent it off to the lab, and it came back to be 1,860 years old, so nearly 2,000 years old. At nearly 2,000 years old, this dugout canoe is the oldest watercraft found yet in Wisconsin. We have a tendency to think that people who lived long ago didn't move around a lot, and it's just not true. Uh, they moved around a lot. The Birchmark canoe is probably universal boat of the Great Lakes tribes. The roots and the cedar and everything was available from the environment to make a birch bark canoe. We used to go up into Canada in birch bark canoes, the huge ones, up to Montreal and uh, trade with the French. Well, the birch bark canoe had to be really sturdy and able to withstand the waves on the Great Lakes. Off the coast of Manitowoc and Sheboygan lie many of Wisconsin's oldest shipwrecks. In 1994, a fishing tug out of two rivers, the Susie Q, snagged its nets on an object underwater. They asked us divers if we could retrieve the net for them. The net buoy was floating on the surface. They told us about where it was. We went out there, took a look at it electronically, 
The net had snagged on a shipwreck, sitting upright with its mast still standing. And it was a short time after we sent uh, two divers down to see if they could uh, work on that net. They also wanted to see what it was. They didn't get much beyond the mast at that very first time, but that mast was a dead giveaway that they had found a schooner. A sonar towfish pulled past the wreck, provided the first glimpse of the ship from bow to stern. See the actual shape. The back end broke down or the bow broke down. More dives gave clues to its identity which was later confirmed to be the schooner Galley Nipper, Wisconsin's oldest shipwreck. Turns out the Galley Nipper was built as the schooner Nancy Dousman in 1832. And she was owned by Michael Dousman, who was a fur trader up at Michel Mackinac in the 18, uh, teens and 20s. He became one of Milwaukee's largest grain merchants. The Nancy Dousman would go on to take part in most of Wisconsin's frontier industries, beginning with carrying loads of fur to Eastern markets. On a return trip in 1833, it stopped at the growing settlement of Green Bay, delivering an essential load of supplies. There were a lot of goods that you just couldn't get here. If you wanted anything made of glass, if you wanted dishware, if you wanted silverware, if you wanted nails to build your house, you had to get that all from Buffalo or Oswego. In Milwaukee, new owners cut the ship in two, added 25 feet to the middle, and renamed it the Galley Nipper. The ship went back to work, now carrying bigger cargoes of Wisconsin lumber and grain but its new length made it hard to handle. And in 1854, it was knocked down in a storm and went to the bottom. All of the crew were rescued by a passing schooner. The galley nipper remains an example of the craftsmanship of early hand-built ships. They really were made as works of art. They had beautiful carved figureheads and scroll work on their bows. Their sterns, their transoms, had beautiful carved artwork on them. And finding a ship from that era, from the handcrafted era, where the man worked the beams by hand, literally carving those ships out of oak. And one of those ships might take 20 acres of white oak. They would have to level 20 acres of forest to build the Gallon Emperor is a prime example of a vessel that you can look at every single piece of wood on there, and it's all made of wood, just carved by, by craftsmen. There were hundreds of wooden schooners that you could see out on the lake at any one time if you lived in, say, Milwaukee or Sheboygan or Manitowoc. When schooners and those early wooden steamers were sailing the Great Lakes, you would see this waterfront here in Manitowoc, just chocker block full of boats. It was such a huge part of Wisconsin's economy and Wisconsin's culture. A whole community of people lived there that worked on those ships. With 300 miles of shoreline and a rich maritime past, Door County became the perfect destination for the growing sport of scuba diving in the 1960s. It was probably one of the first places to really catch on. And the thing that drove people in the direction of Door County was shipwrecks. And at the time I lived in the Chicago area, I came up there with my club diving. And I was hooked. You know, we were used to diving in quarries or lakes down at Illinois or Southern Wisconsin. And now I come up here and there's a shipper. And boy, I, I would eventually I moved up here. And... The growing 
popularity of scuba was due in part to the efforts of a diver from Wisconsin named Zale Perry. How far down do you dive with this rig? With the Aqualung, I dove to 209 feet. By my, you say, it must take a lot of courage to go down that deep. I get panicky when the barber puts my head in the sink for a shampoo. <laughs> Isn't that getting in pretty deep for a young girl like you? Yes, it is, Gosh. Oh, it's the women's world record. Well, congratulations. Perry grew up on the waters of Pewaukee Lake and in high school joined the Sam Howard Aquafollies as a synchronized swimmer, performing at fairs and other large events. Moving to California, she learned to scuba dive and became a dive instructor. Greenland was anxious to have a specimen of this strange fish. pounds of sheer muscle was too much. Perry joined the production team of the popular television program Sea Hunt and gave its star, Lloyd Bridges, early lessons in how to dive. She also appeared in many episodes of Sea Hunt, a program that boosted the interest in scuba diving around the country. I got interested in diving uh, back about 1959 from watching uh, Lloyd Bridges on Sea Hunt. I was just fascinated by it. So I looked up in the yellow pages and telephone book where the closest dive shop was and uh, went over and I uh, ended up with a tank regulator uh, mass and snorkel. Frank Hoffman would go on to shock the shipwreck diving world by finding the first completely intact wooden schooner, something most experts thought impossible. I was uh, working summers in Door County as an outboard mechanic. So I went down and introduced myself to Frank because, frankly, I thought he was a charlatan. We'd heard this rumor about this, oh, my gosh, an intact wooden ship. That can't be. And anybody that says so has got to be a fake. I went down and finds this guy is very, very genuine. In fact, particularly when he looked me in the eye, say, hey, would you like to go out and dive it on Sunday? Well, that <laughs> pretty well settled the matter. Frank sold his business in Chicago, bought a farm grill up in Door County, and expanded it with a motel and a little uh, diver's air station where you could get your scuba tanks filled. And he had a couple of boats. And he started taking divers out to visit this thing because it was a whole new experience. And boy, we had people come from all over as far as California and so on to visit this wreck. The wreck was identified as the Jenny Bell, a Door County schooner that sank in a storm in 1881 while carrying cordwood and hemlock bark used for tanning leather. All of the crew were rescued. That was kind of a spark and people said, wow, you're gonna actually find these things intact. And there were all these artifacts and stuff on them. But the Jenny Bell was soon broken to pieces in an attempt by treasure hunters to lift it off the bottom. They made arrangements uh, secretly to raise the wreck and diving at night out there. The location was kept secret. How did they find it? They had followed us out there with a boat equipped with radar so that we didn't see them following us out, but in fact they were able to locate the wreck. They put two cables under it, ran those two cables up to a single cable and tried to lift this thing, which is settled several feet into the mud. And essentially what happened is that they just snapped it in two in the process and it scattered down into this trench. Remarkably, Frank Hoffman would soon discover another intact shipwreck. It was a mystery ship, one that would change forever the way shipwreck hunters and archaeologists would view the shipwrecks lying in Wisconsin waters.
At the time Frank Hoffman discovered the schooner Jenny Bell, shipwrecks were not well protected by state and federal laws. He brought up one of the ship's anchors and placed it behind his new business in Egg Harbor. This was finders keepers times in those days. And so the idea that when you were on the shipwreck, if you didn't say maybe uh, pick up a plate in the galley or maybe even saw off a fitting, but you better bring something up for you. Although treasure hunters had wrecked the Jenny Bell, Hoffman's discovery of an intact schooner shocked the diving community. People said, wow, you can actually find these things intact. Well, what are the chances that this will ever happen again? Dick Karpowski, a fisherman in Menominee, just called me on the phone and asked if I could retrieve their nets. They got them tangled up in some object underwater. And of course, it was, a, well, it was in November of 67. It was a cold, miserable day off, but the water was halfway calm. I couldn't get in contact with any of the uh, other divers in our group uh, in that short of a notice to come up and help us out with the nets. So I had to make the first dive myself. Going down alone, I wasn't feeling too well, you know, myself, but uh, it was a job that had to be done. And of course, our Green Bay waters are dark. And your light fades out at about uh, 60 to 70 feet. When I did get down to the net, and of course, then I seen what was down there, and uh, it was an old sailing ship. Back in them days, we only had uh, pressure cookers with car batteries in them and COP and pit lights. The pressure cookers that I had, the light kept going on and off, and of course, visibility was a foot and a half, and the light went out, you didn't see nothing. And I did the uh, best that I could, uh, freeing the net, cutting the net, and freeing it up. After a certain length of time, I knew that I couldn't accomplish the uh, job myself. And uh, so then I returned back up to the surface. And I was never so happy to get up on top as I was after that dive. I knew at the end of that dive that we uh, were on an old sailing schooner. Uh, how old exactly, I do not, I didn't know at that time. But that idea that I knew it was uh, big and I knew it was beautiful. And it was uh, something that had never been touched before. I felt the best thing was for me to uh, call in for extra divers, finish reading the nets up. After we had accomplished the job of getting the nets off, we took a tour of the ship so to see what it was. We found the wheel of the ship and there was still canvas on the wheel itself. And this was to protect somebody from putting their arm or leg through it if the ship would take a fast turn. As to the interior of the ship, we found out that it was entirely filled with silt. So it's in about a uh, foot or so of the uh, deck, you know, inside the cargo holds. The cabin area uh, was the same thing. And when a diver would go in uh, to the silk to get any articles out from inside the ship, the silk would stir up and it would hang in the water. And uh, you didn't realize whether up or down or sideways that uh, it was like swimming through a uh, bottle of India ink. That was very exciting because we had no idea what the wreck was. In those days, none of those records and so on were available. There was very little interest in that sort of thing. And so for the better part of a year and a half, we had no idea what it was. Hoffman's team of divers brought in a small pump to begin removing the silt and brought up artifacts that gave clues about the identity of the ship. I brought up a bowl out of the uh, galley and on the bottom of it is a bunch of embossing on there and we were able to determine that it was pre-Civil War. And so this vessel has got to be very early, 1840s and 50s, 60s. That's real old stuff as far as Great Lakes shipping is concerned. As the divers brought up more artifacts, well preserved in the cold, thick silt, the media began to follow the story. We got just enough artifacts out that this craze was going wild. And the idea that, first of all, a totally intact wreck had been found. 
They don't know what's in it. They don't even know what it is. It's the mystery ship from 19 fathoms. The excitement got so much that all of a sudden, Marinette Marine Corporation, particularly Harold de Russia there, who was a big uh, maritime history fan, he essentially gives the project a 60-foot LCM craft equipped with a very large 8-inch diameter salvage pump. We just outfitted this thing for diving, so now all of a sudden we have this huge craft to, to work with. After connecting the big pump, divers began removing tons of silt. More artifacts were revealed, frozen in time on the ship's last day at sail. One big crack came up, this nice picture of it. it. had the usual little silt on the top of it, so we scraped it off, and the thing is, is full of what was called a crock cheese which was a very common staple on ships. And then they get put it onto a biscuit and so on. I was a microbiologist at the time, so we took a sample and by golly, we could still recover the lactobacillus that had formed on it. The thing was still viable in the cheese. And so we uh, sent it out to the Kraft Foods people and it turned out that it was the world's oldest sample of edible cheese that I, Tasted is always the question. Yeah, I did, and it was terrible. <laughs> but in talking to people who were familiar with that sort of thing, they said the stuff was always terrible. <laughs> in another case, we came up with a couple of ducks. They were pretty much intact. The flesh and so on was on them. The uh, head and so on was missing. Uh, these things were prepared for a meal. That was about the same time that we identified the wreck and realized that the captain and uh, a couple of the crewmen had gone down with it. And we got real uneasy about working in that silt down there. As it turned out, there were no human remains that were found on the Clark. They were not on board the vessel. The mystery ship was identified as the Alvin Clark, built in 1846 and sunk in 1864. Almost a little tornado came dancing across Green Bay and smacked her and capsized her and sent her to the bottom. It's now thought the ship transported lumber for timber pirates who cut down trees on government-owned land. When we got just enough artifacts out that this craze was going wild and all of a sudden you're up to the point where you've identified it and so on. And gosh, you've got this thing. Uh, at that time, there was no other known tack wreck. It just seemed like the logical thing would be to bring it up and preserve it. And of course, Hoffman really wanted to do it at that point. He'd, uh, he really had the, the fever. He'd almost uh, dedicated his life to this whole business. The first step in raising the ship was to find a way to loosen the masts from the deck and haul them up with a crane. Next, the group figured out a plan to raise the ship itself using six cables tunneled under the hull. Where do you buy a tool to do that? We had to invent one. We bent a piece of two inch aluminum pipe that would match the curvature of the hull. On the end of it, we designed what we called a dredging head. Attach that on one end of the pipe, fire hose on the other, and you wrestle that underwater. You could just slowly push that pipe right underneath the Clark, and this thing will just dredge its way right under, following the curvature of the hull. When it popped up on the other side, you tied a nylon line on it, pulled the thing back out, and there was a cable waiting from the surface that you then attached to the nylon line. It took six weeks to put six cables underneath that puppy, and that was a real job. A lift uh, barge had to be uh, uh, found. And of course, Marinette Marine came through once again and locating one for us. They had gotten the uh, steel cables ordered that we were going to put in underneath the uh, ship itself. From this, we used a set of box and pulleys and with uh, 24 steel cables 
going up to the lift barge. The lift barge was positioned over the ship itself, and uh, on the lift barge we had uh, four hand crank winches. For every 100 turns on the tanks, we could raise the ship approximately five inches. It was very uh, tiring on our crew because they had worked so long. Boats would come out to see what was going on. All of the sightseers, newspaper men, television people, and everything else. No one was allowed onto uh, Cleo's barge or onto the lift barge itself until they put in their 100 turns on the crank to help us raise the ship. Everybody pitched in, and it was a tremendous thing, you know, to see uh, hundreds of people out there all helping us work in the uh, final lifting process. As the cranking came to an end, the ship became visible under the barge. Its bowsprit rose above the water, and the crew triumphantly posed on it as the barge ready to tow the ship to Marinette for the final raising. Marinette Marine closed the shipyard, and there were over 15,000 people that had come down to watch the Elvin Clark race to the surface. And uh, it was a tremendous feeling. We had uh, dove on a ship for uh, two years. We had never seen the ship itself in its entirety. All we could see was three and four feet. We were amazed just as much as everybody else was. When that thing hit the surface and you saw the size of that thing, we just went, wow, you know, this is really something else again. The thing was all so nice and clean, but it was just absolutely uh, amazing. We decided to see how, how badly it was leaking and we had pumped it out. We slacked the cables off and the darn thing floated. 105 years it had been underwater. And as far as we could tell, it wasn't hardly leaking a drop. As they cleaned up the ship, the divers brought up the remaining artifacts that would tell the story of life on an early schooner. After a long period of kiln drying, the ship was re-rigged and became a popular tourist attraction. All of the rigging was put on the rat lines, the whole business, she looked just like she was sailing, and she was floating in this little private harbor uh, called the Mystery Ship Seaport between uh, Marinette, Wisconsin, and Menominee, Michigan. And so she was a, a regular museum. The Alvin Clark yielded a boatload of maritime information. How the sailors lived, the design and construction of the ship, and much more. But over the next two decades, exposed to the elements, the Alvin Clark began to deteriorate. What she really needed to very terribly, she really needed to be dry docked and to have a building over her. It's a feeling of myself and our group that actually we did our job and it's now for somebody to come forth and preserve and take care of the ship. Frank Hoffman moved the ship out of the water, but try as he might, he couldn't raise the funds to preserve it. And the money for it just, just wasn't there no matter what you do or how you, you tried and it eventually disintegrated and was unceremoniously bulldozed up and run off to a, a landfill site in the uh, 90s. The destruction of the Alvin Clark signaled the end of the Finders Keepers era of Wisconsin shipwrecks. New laws were passed to protect shipwrecks, encouraging divers to visit, but to take only pictures and leave only bubbles. In 1954, 15 years before the raising of the Alvin Clark, a Dutch cargo ship, the Prince Willem V, loaded up in Milwaukee. After taking on a full cargo of Wisconsin products, the ship departed at dusk in strong October winds. Three miles out, the Prince Willem collided with an oil barge. As it began to sink, the Coast Guard arrived 
and rescued all of the crew. The Prince Willem came to rest on its side in 80 feet of water. The Army Corps of Engineers declared the wreck a hazard to navigation and requested proposals to remove it. Corps of Engineers assumed that the wreck would have to either be cut up, dynamited, dragged out to deeper water, or raised in order to clear it to the required 40 feet deep. Milwaukee salvage diver Max Noel won the bid to clear the hazard and gain ownership of the wreck. He soon discovered that it would be easier to clear than anyone expected. This is the gangplank from the Prince Willem V. This was sticking up to 31 feet of the surface. The Corps of Engineers felt that the entire wreck stuck up that high. Max Noel got the contract to clear it to the required 40 feet, and all he had to do was cut this loose. It took about 20 minutes. As a child in the 1920s, Max Noel became fascinated with the Jules Verne classic, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. The growing popularity of the open bottom diving helmet inspired many Wisconsin teenagers like Max and his friend Jack Brown to build their own. Jack made a rubber suit out of old inner tubes and a helmet from a five gallon paint can held down with window weights. Jack lent his suit to Max to make a dive into Lake Michigan. And according to Max's writings years later, he was hooked. He wanted to be underwater whenever he could. While a student at MIT, Max bought a used diving suit, which he brought home one summer. With the help of his friends Jack Brown and Vern Netzow, he discovered the wreck of the J.M. Almondinger, a wooden steam barge that ran aground in a storm near Mequon in 1895. After college, Noel met and teamed up with John D. Craig, a diver and Hollywood adventure film producer. Craig had secured a contract to work on the salvage of the Lusitania, an ocean liner sunk off the coast of Ireland in 1915. The Lusitania that got us into World War I had been torpedoed off of Ireland in 312 feet of water. And the deepest dive of record at that time was made by a US Navy diver 306 feet. So how could they get at the treasures of the Lusitania? In the quest to reach the Lusitania, Max Knoll and Jack Brown would team up once again to design and build a revolutionary diving suit. Noel and John Craig would volunteer as human guinea pigs in dangerous experiments, hoping to shatter the limits of how deep shipwreck divers could go and how long they could stay down.